That was for the thumbnail. <laughs> so, Miss Smith interviewed me and wanted to know about what it's like to be trans and in the military. I gave a very honest video. And it's through Zoom, so it's going to be really low quality, really choppy, and the audio is not that great. Um, but it's really good information, and I thought to share it online. And I just want to say that it is that video is my personal experience. Everyone's experience is different, and those are all my own statements. And it's not um, they're not official statements from any government entity. It's all just me and my own personal experience. And I hope that people find a lot of value and education in it. And if anyone wants to interview me some more, go ahead and message me uh, through my Instagram. That's probably the easiest way to go about it. Please enjoy the rest of the video and I'd love to know what you think. Okay, so um, can you briefly share your name, your pronouns, and your role in the military? Mm -hmm. My name is Cordelta. I am a command and control battle management operator. My AFSC, my Air Force specialty code, my job title is One Charlie Five. Now, what that means is I work in ops. I work on the operations side. There's like administrative, uh, different tactical maintenance sides of, of, of the military of the Air Force. I work in ops, operation. My career field is very diverse. I can do many things from air mission planning to managing data links to ensure joint units receive communications to directly speaking to pilots in the middle of air missions to ensure contingency operations are met and make sure that we execute the task of the commander's intent. I am so glad that you wrote these out because there's no way that I would call all of that because that's a lot, that sounds very technical. <laughs> I well, I just came up with that like off the top of my head. It's type of like that sounds very Air Force like woohoo, you know. So yeah, I keep the people. I'm very very specific on the people I keep around me, and so the people I keep around me are people that uh, inspire me and people that are just very um, understanding. They don't have to be open-minded. They don't have to be any one political way. They just have to be like understanding. Okay. Yeah. So how did you end up joining the Air Force? I joined the Air Force because it seemed like the smartest, most advanced branch in terms of policy and technology and agreed the most with what I liked. What is the most important lesson you've learned over your career so far? And also how long have you been in? And February 12th, that would be exactly four years. I joined February 12th, 2019. So I would be in four years in service. And I signed six years in service. So I would have two years left in my contract. The biggest lessons that I've learned is that no one's going to care more about your health. No one's going to care about your career, your finances, your body more than you. Sure, you have a supervisor who can help you with your career, uh, a PCM. Uh, what PCM is a primary care manager who can help you with your health, fitness rep, and each squadron, there's a fitness representative who can help you with your body and fitness, but it, it's your life, it's your, no one's gonna care about it more than you. Mm. I've had bad supervisors, I've had bad PCMs, I've had the shorthand at a lot of things, some more than others, and but everyone does at some point or another. And, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an example with a primary care manager. I, I, I hate it. <laughs> I want to yell, but I, you'll, you probably hear this a lot. There's a lot of frustration with it, with, with trans people in the military. It's a very common thing. Um, you'll hear a lot of frustration in the whole health system overall, regardless of trans or not. But I, on paper, I wrote, I was, I wrote this on all caps. I cannot say on paper how frustrated and disappointed and wounded I was when I had people who did not care about me. The lazy answer is, quote, no, 
even when I brought up all the right policies and guidelines and, and references, various medical providers simply did not want to start local treatment to start, example, transition for hormone therapy until I had gone to a medical TDY. A TDY is uh, temporary duty. Until I went to a work trip that was delayed by a year, even though treatment could have been started, absolutely covered locally. And I was also coded on a restriction waiver that didn't allow me to PCS, which means to move different bases. And upon going to that medical work trip, I brought up my issues and my frustrations mm -hmm. and learned that I could have started treatment locally. Like I brought, I brought all the pieces of paper and said, here, look here, like this says I can. And still the PCM said, no, I don't really feel comfortable with it. We're not going to do it. PCMs have that power. Mm -hmm. There is that bias. And I, 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 my, my moving basis was going to be to Korea. This is an example I wanted to tell you about. No one's going to care more about your transition, about your health, about making sure you get that travel voucher through defense travel system to get your money back more than you. Otherwise, things will get lost. Things will be forgotten about. It, it's very mind taxing to keep calling people, keep messaging people, essentially annoy people and say, hey, you have this done? Do you have that done? Because it'll just naturally just fall off. It'll mm -hmm. just happen. It'll just happen. Which brings me to my next point. So that's one important lesson I've learned. Second thing I've learned is that there is almost always a workaround to something. Did someone say no? Depending on what that is, there could be someone who can help navigate or find an alternative path to achieve similar results. There's uh, two different sites in the military, or three, but uh, there's enlisted an officer. Mm -hmm. Officers is, is more high military brass enlisted are kind of like the uh, like like the worker bees, the worker ants in a way. And because of that, there is this thing called rank. Uh, I've only been in four years, which is really not a long time. And for me to try and push something or be persistent with something, it's not going to have as much oomph as someone who is at a higher rank, let's say 12 years, or an officer with, let's say, 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, that Things like that is very powerful. And that's, that's a fine line that you walk to, to make sure you get things done, you get what you want to happen, whether it's a mission or something personal. I want to give you another personal example. This happened very recently, the other day. Um, I was trying to book a flight. And one of the connecting flights was with a Alliance third-party airline. And when I was trying to book it, I called the primary airline to, to get a person to help me to book it. And they said that the flight was canceled. And I was wondering, like, why is this flight canceled? This is weird. I was not satisfied with the answer. I was like, is there anything we could do? Is there anything that can happen? And I asked it in, like, three different ways. And the person on the, on the representative with the airline they said, no, we can't help you anyway. Sorry, this you, you can't take this flight. You have to find an alternative. I didn't want to pay like $2,000 for a flight. That was ridiculous. So what I did, I made a whole new mileage account with that third-party alliance airline, then reached out to them to say, hey, is this flight real? They're like, yeah. I was like, okay, let's get this connected. Let's like work this out. Mm -hmm. And I did. I ended up booking a trans-Pacific flight from Auckland to Sydney, to LA, to Phoenix for $324 because I used my resources correctly and I did not care if I hurt other people's feelings by finding a workaround. That is a very special skill to have and it's walking a fine line from completing your mission. For me, I'm flying from New Zealand back home to Phoenix for $324. Mm -hmm. I got, I made it, I got, I made it happen. But you can also step on people's toes. Let's say a person at a higher rank, they say no, but you still want something to happen. It's like when you when mom says no, but dad says yes, you, know, you got to be careful with that. Um, and that could be used in a lot of other things. So there's always a workaround and no one's going to care more, than, more about you and your life and your career more than you. 
So you have to be really proactive on a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. What's one piece of advice you'd give to a person who is trans and wants to join the military? Oh, Jordan. Really? I'm serious. Don't do it. The political and bureaucratic process with insurance and getting signature signatures, keeping communication with your primary care manager, case manager, booking these appointments within a reasonable time frame is such a nightmare waiting for months and months for something to have a provider, then to only have your medical provider, let's say they PCS or you PCS or have paperwork lost, just have, just have it lost. And you have to restart things is so frustrating. That's why I'm yelling right now. You, for, for those that are like, hey, I'm trans and I'm thinking about joining the military. If you're, let's say, if you like presented uh, your birth gender and you want to transition after you get there, that is going to be such a hard process. And if, that, if that's the case and you uh, go to basic training as your, your, you know, your gender assigned at birth, it might cause some dysphoria and it, it, you might not even make it through basic training, let alone. And then can you actually survive the military? Okay. Can you actually do that? Some people, they just mentally just, they can't take it. It's tough. It's rough, but it really makes you stronger. And I did it, but what I want other people to do it, the, the amount of headache it was is insane. Um, you would literally be better off working at like Starbucks because they have a good health care for, for trans people or like working at a place with a good insurance or private practice to save you the months, if not years of paperwork process and having so many people up in your medical business. And even though let's say hormone therapy, that's pretty easy, but let's say something complicated like facial surgery, vocal surgery, top or bottom surgery. Uh, very select things are paid for by insurance, no matter what insurance, and, and the TRICARE, which is the military, DOD-wide, is really behind on a lot of things. Uh, would insurance even reimburse you if you paid out of pocket? Mm -hmm. And there are actually few competent surgical providers for the things I was talking about that very few of them actually use insurance. So you're going to have to use, you're going to have to essentially default to and mentally say, I'm going to have to pay for everything out of pocket or anything else is just like great extra other than hormone therapy. And mm -hmm. for some people, the definition of what's medically necessary is different for other people. And I understand that. So I hope I explained why I really suggest that people not join the military. What was it like coming out for you to yourself, to others, to the mm -hmm. military community? Tell me your story. The process it, 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 to anyone is very long and soul searching. Just like, who do I want as my significant other? Who, what do I wanna do as a vocation? Something that's, these are all things that partly have to do with your identity. True, for anyone trying to find their identity is hard, especially for someone who goes outside the norms of what identity they were given at birth. I, I just knew though, I always knew, and I go more in depth about it in a video I made on YouTube. I always had a unique diversity in the mind, body, spirit was. I just didn't know what the word was. I didn't have a proper vocabulary, vocabulary word to associate it with. You ask, let's say, uh, you ask a 12 year old, like words, like what does forlorn, pensive, contemporary, exquisite, remarkable? Those are all a higher caliber vocabulary words than, than basic words. I just didn't have a word for it. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to attach it to a word. And the coming out process, started off with, I knew once I learned what the word trans was, I was, uh, 
I was in late middle school and I was terrified. I knew that with my parents that I was with after I was, I'm adopted and I just knew like, there's no way that this can happen. I just knew like, I was, I was terrified. I was defeated inside. I just knew like, this, this won't be able to be a thing. See other people, oh, look at me and my supportive parents, like the, just the jealousy I had. I was terrified. I had to keep it to myself and I tried to quote unquote kill it by, let's see, what's the most manliest thing I can do? I'll join the military. Yeah, that sounds great. Join the military. And I thought, you know, let's try and find other ways to find myself through church, nature, people, meditation. There was mm -hmm. one thing left that I had to confront and address. It took a lot of talking with a neutral, unbiased, professional opinion to sort things through. And throughout all of the healing and discovery, I shed, I just let go of a lot of, a lot of hate, a lot of prejudices, old beliefs, old morals. And I became just more understanding of, of just people in general. I just became more understanding to a different level I didn't, I didn't even know because I was al always really understanding of people but there were some still like subconscious, like deep rooted things that um, was part of the process with, with, with my therapist that I just let go of and took on new, more healthier, more accepting and understanding beliefs. Mm -hmm. And throughout that process, I, I became okay with the possibility that I was and always have been trans. And then I was, I was just okay with confronting my identity finally. Mind you, the whole process of everything. And then we're talking, we're talking like 20 years old is when I actually said, you know what, we're got, we got to take care of this. When I was 20, we got mm -hmm. to do something about this. And um, from 20 to 21, I was like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Uh, 21 to 22. I, I was like, this is so me. And I, I was blossoming in it. And I, I was like, I, this is so me. I, I need this. Like, I was not afraid anymore. And I was ready to really like spread my wings. And I truly accepted my whole identity and was blossoming. And I am someone truly unique where else are you going to find someone who is half Burmese half Honduran literal opposite sides of the world who was in foster care and joined the military moved 44 times as trans and lived to tell tale not only lived but thriving, being an artist, getting various accolades within my military service while I was also undergoing some borderline serious mental, mental problems. And I, I'm just unshakable now. I'm unshakable now. Nothing can affect me mentally. I'm just too mentally strong. I am too mentally cunning that I just can't let anything get to me now. And um, I am unapologetic when I need to get things done and I will make things happen. Yeah, no, I love that. And you're right there. It is, it is extraordinary. It is extraordinary that, mm -hmm. you, that your story has that many layers to it and that you are doing as well as you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, good. Well, more you in the world is a good thing. So yeah, thank you. Sounds thank amazing. you. And then this is where I stopped like typing everything else is uh, just in my head. I did look through all of this, but I just okay. didn't write it. Yeah. Well, let me, um, I know that I definitely want to talk to you about like, you know, how did, when you came out to like the military community, um, how did that go for you? Did you find support? Did you find lack of support? How was it? I, 
probably unofficially came out at the worst time was in the middle of a deployment. Okay. I was in the middle of a deployment. Now, mind you, that deployment was in the U.S. So can you really call that a deployment? What paper it is, but I don't, I don't think so. Um, I was in the middle of that. And before, prior to that, I set up an expectation of myself, I set up a personality that I kind of just do whatever I want. I don't really care. Like I would go, I, I took um, a week vacation and I just surfed all along the Oregon coast and explored the West Oregon coast. I just like do things like this. Uh, not in a spontaneous unresponsible way no it was a it was a it was a really amazing trip I would go on hikes I just do whatever I want and um I think people knew that I was a little fruity <laughs> I think people knew so for some people kind of wasn't as much of a surprise okay. and at the end of it no one cared that's like the perfect word for it no one cared now that could be a good thing. It could also be a bad thing because the only thing worse than something that's negative is something indifferent. Mm. Because no one cared, there wasn't any really negative. There wasn't really any positive. It was very, it was pretty monotone throughout. And partly no one knew how to come to me and ha have a conversation. No one really knew what to do for a lot of people I was the first person they ever met who was trans or was undergoing the process too and no one wanted to ask any question that could be possibly like uncomfortable or competing on health information or might might bring up like a bad memory or they just didn't no one just knew what to do um so I just I did my own thing and that's how, kind of how it was. And to the military community, I just don't take any BS anymore. I, I mean, I kind of used to be walked on when I was mm -hmm. a younger, younger, younger airman. I just didn't quite know, like, this is acceptable behavior. This is unacceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I give off a presence where I'm not one that likes, I just keep work at work. I also just don't really care about drama. And so there won't be any to me, you know, that's how it happened. So mostly in that aspect, positive, because I won't accept anything otherwise. Okay, got it. Any, or did you run up against any specific barriers? I know that you already talked about that. Absolutely. The, the, yeah. Absolutely. But any other ones? Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of gray area to things. Like, is this covered? Is this not covered? How can we get it covered? Can you get reimbursed? Now, this is everything with the with the medical side of things. Mm -hmm. Legally, I'm all done. I have my ID. I have my uh, driver's license. I have my passport. I have my birth certificate, Social Security, but socially and that's pretty okay um in the beginning of transition like it, it, there it, there was that there was that awkward phase it was a really awkward phase my hair was much shorter um voice was much deeper than it is now like now this is like my normal natural voice mm -hmm. um that was a bit of a social barrier now it's like not much of a problem so really it's just medical it's just okay. medical stuff that I'm really trying to fight yeah. and make happen. That's, okay. that's the biggest barriers. What helps me overcome those barriers? Being persistent and saying, this is what I want and I want it. If not, you're going to put in a referral um, and I'm going to make sure this gets done. Mm -hmm. I'm at a new place now. It's so much better. It's so much better where I was before in Idaho. I'm just, just going to put it out there. Just absolute dog shit. Mm. I'm putting this on record all right now online. Okay. It just was terrible. It, and here in Tucson, it's just because 
it's because people care a little more to put a little more effort in. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Gotcha. Yeah. Were they, were they competent in trans issues and care or did you have to train them? (laughs) Not really. Yeah. It was, it was a bit of a both training effort. It was a bit of a training effort. Yeah. Um, The one I see now here in Tucson Mm-hmm. I've only seen one since being here in November. That's how that's how backed up things are. When mm-hmm. I said like you have to wait months for things, like holy smokes, um, yeah. is a little more aware. The the one here, so it's it's a bit better here. Yeah. Okay, but there's no guarantee that like that person was going to be. It sounds like from what I've when I've talk to other people and even kind of like what you're saying you know it's like you're assigned somebody pretty much they may or may not be familiar with your issue it does help when you say uh just generally just say lgbt topics and um, it might say okay there's someone who who at least knows something rather than have someone completely unaware that's something i mentioned um it was much easier here because they have all the notes from last base. So there's a little bit of continuity. Um, what is something that a mental health provider needs to know specifically about working with transgender folks, especially those in the military? If you could like give one piece of advice. One piece of advice, uh, just or learn, t- research, research, at least be in the process, ha- care, know what it's, like to be trans know what the processes are like read up on policy so just know just like research um makes er and once everyone's on the same page it makes things smoother do you know about the the air force policy xyz the dodi policy xyz no i haven't heard that well in advance read it if you don't know reach out to the theme you or, and, and, and every branch, it's different. So I guess Sparta is a great one resource because they ha- can reach out to different joint branches. But just um, just research, research. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because the um, like there's different standards that providers can use too. And I just learned recently, you know, when I'm working with folks, I follow, well, I follow the informed consent model, but insurance likes to follow follow WPATH. <laughs> so yeah. I end up writing a lot of um, letters for folks um, so that they can seek reimbursement for their medical care. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had recently learned that, you know, while the civilian role tends to use WPATH standards, the military uses the endocrine society standards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of interesting too, that they're, you know, I mean, it's, there's just, multiple layers to this. And so um, if I was familiar with WPATH, but I'm not familiar with the Endocrine Society, I might write you the wrong letter, right? So um, so I agree with you that the research is important, but it's interesting. Every single person that I've talked to from Sparta about this, you have all said the same thing when it comes to the most important thing is to care and to be curious. Literally. So there's a up. trend. So there's a trend. <laughs> I know, no, I, I knew I wasn't, I knew, I knew that you were going to hear a lot of similar things. It's really interesting. That one is, um, I was not expecting it to be that simple. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Uh, right. You can have someone that's in a private practice and their performance is based off of how good they are and how many patients they have versus uh, let's say I got done with my doctorates, but then Air Force recruiter says, hey, you want your medical bills or you want your medical education mm-hmm. paid for? Join the Air Force. We'll uh, give you an immediate major, immediate captain, immediate major pay. Uh, you won't be commanding anyone, but you'll get this pay and uh, you have to serve for a certain amount of years. Sound like a good deal? Yeah, sounds like a great deal. And then they're like, so no matter what, I get paid X, Y, Z amount of money every two weeks. Easy. You think that person wants to try as hard? No. 
Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that is true. I'm in private practice and it's true. It's like, you know, people will not keep showing up if they don't feel like you are meeting their needs. That's yeah. So the, the necessity to care is not as much of a, a priority, mm, okay. which is very sad. Yeah, that is sad. Um, what is one question that you wish I had asked you and how would you have answered? You know, if I could really have everything in a perfect world. <laughs> I I just hmm. the 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 Department of Defense budget for healthcare throughout all branches, throughout military, civilian, anyone in the DOD is like 40 something billion dollars. Hmm. It's some, just, just some like insane number. I don't know how I calculated it. So in my mind, it's just me personally saying that budget is virtually unlimited. Hmm. The budget for men's Viagra is a certain amount of money. The amount of money that was used, I don't know, I don't remember what year, I think it was like 2017. So it might have, it definitely would, might have changed um, for trans healthcare is like one tenth of that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just such a like low ball number. Does it require a lot of money? I mean, sure, there's some surgeries, yeah, that require money. But what if you think about like how much it would cost if you raise that budget a little bit, it'd be like nothing. Like let's say I let's say I just asked like yeah, they should raise the budget by $20 million. When you think mm-hmm. of like $20 million versus $40 billion, mm-hmm. it's like literally if I had um, a million dollars and you were dirt poor and you asked for two cents and I said, no, I won't give you two cents even though I have a million dollars, just something like that. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow. Yeah. So, and, and then it's like it, the because it's it's government it's paid for by the taxpayers what can the military do to take better care of trans service members i think just make processes smoother mm-hmm. i have had to sometimes re-ask questions so many times um, policy and guidance is is pretty vague it's very vague so let's say i want x y z done how do i do that will it get reimbursed will it not um Mm -hmm. there was a policy that came out april 30th 2021 and in it it said that um next version will be available in a year so april 30th 2022 we're almost to april 30th 2023 there's still not a new version oh interesting okay so with interim guidance (laughs) okay what are your career goals my career goals, um, there was a wrench thrown in my plans literally last night. So my career goals might change. Um, I've been in the Air Force four years and I have two years left. My career goals are to um, set myself up for success with um, my degree in organizational leadership, work with, let's say, market. I hate that word. I work with the creative side of Lululemon or Delta Airlines or McKinsey and company um, to do that. However, last night I got an email saying that I did a palace chase. I don't know what palace chase. Essentially, I can move to Hawaii um, and there was an interview process with that to be a part of the guard. And so that might change things. So that's what are my career goals. Last night, I would have told you what I first said, <laughs> mm-hmm. but something literally happened and now I have an interview. And I, even though I just got here to Arizona, I might be moving to Hawaii. Very oh, wow. soon. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. How do you stay resilient? Oh God. Um, perspective. I mean, you know how much I was complaining to you and whatever. I mean, there are there. Imagine being like trans in like a third world country. Mm-hmm. Like, how terrifying would that be? And then a lot of people on the civilian side resort to sex work, mm-hmm. and. And whether you want to or not, that's dangerous. You know how freaking lucky I am that at 22, without a degree yet, I make more than my math teacher. What the heck? How, that's like unfair. Um, the fact that I am able to even be trans and serve my country is something I should be grateful for. Yeah, I should be grateful that I can even do this. But I have one of these, which is, a, which is an estri- estradiol pill. That's what this mm. is. Mm-hmm. I can be grateful, but I can also realize that things need to move forward. If we stayed in 1820, whatever, if we stayed in 1950, whatever, forever, we need to move forward with things. So how do I stay resilient? I have the um, perspective to know that I'm grateful as hell that I can even do this and not get kicked out of service, but also realize that we all are also behind on um, policy in terms of ex- acceptance. We are behind on military capabilities. Um, there are some very scary slash terrifying things with China and Russia that uh, I can't and won't talk about. And um, no other nation can do what we do, really. Things happen and just make, get things done. That's how I stay resilient is with the progress of it. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. What's one thing you want people to know about transgender military members? (sighs) They're all complex. Uh, they they can have they could be as young as me as 22. There are some people who are majors, lieutenant colonels that are like 10 years older than me, 20 years older than me. Um, some of us ha- we all have different backgrounds. So um, and we're just we're just human too. Like like we have we're, there's there's more to me than just being trans. There's more to me than just being in the military. For a lot of people. That's all their identity is like, I'm trans and all my YouTube videos are just fucking trans related. I, and, and some people was like military, all my videos are military related. Like I and other people and pretty much everyone, we have goals. We have aspirations. I want a family. I want a degree. I want to travel. I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. I love that. I am terrifyingly smart and I can very quickly learn how to make weapons of mass destruction, which is something I wanted to do, which was my process of joining the military. I wanted to literally use my creative side to uh, create mass genocide. Mm. Um, So yeah, (laughs) but also, but also create like awesome things for humanitarian aid. I was a, I was a very interesting 18 year old. Um, (laughs) What can allies do to support the military? I was going ahead of you. That's okay. No, that's the great, that's the next question. What can, what can what allies do to support the transgender military community? Uh, just like just just be understanding. Just say, hey, how can I help? What can I do for you? I mean, we're all a part of the same team. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like we're all Americans, or we're all human. I'll be more worldwide. We're all human. What, what unites us is more powerful and is much more stronger than what divides us. Is there anything else you want people to know? I think you did a great job. Uh, I think I just want people to know me. I really want people to know my, my story and, and listen to some of uh, the things I have to say and listen to some of my life lessons. I'm just very grateful. Mm-hmm. I have 
I, I don't want to be cocky, but I have an immense amount of wisdom for 22 years old with the amount of things I've been through and some of the things that have been uh, literally spiritually handed to me. Uh, and I just want, what else do I want people to know? Just to get to know me in other various ways. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to 